For the last several weeks, I guess more than that, I've been thinking about a message, trying to figure out a way to bring the message about citizenship. Uh, I always, I've got a pastor friend of mine that I bounce things off with, and uh, his, his last words for me on, on Wednesday was, good luck, uh, <clears throat> because we don't often hear about citizenship. Uh, Paul in Philippians said, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we wait a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be his glorified body by the power that enables him even to subject all things unto him. Peter comes along and he adds, <clears throat> excuse me, these words. He says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. So many times I've heard this taught and preached that this is speaking to Israel. Because in, when God called and created this people, they were to be his royal priesthood. But we need to understand that this, this conversation, this salutation is to every believer today. This is your position in Christ. A chosen race, royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Then he says, Behold, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which war age war against your soul. Two views from Scripture. Our citizenship is indeed in heaven. And God views us as sojourners. That's people who wander from place to place, wander through life. If you go over to the Middle East, there's, there's nomadic tribes that have never lived in any one place for any length of time. Their home is a tremendous tent that has all of the luxuries that you would find in any American home, only it's one large tent, and they move from place to place. And Peter, under the, the leadership of the Holy Spirit, reckons or casts a view that we who are in Christ has a citizenship in heaven, but we are exiles and sojourners in this earth. That being said, let me share with you this. We live in this world. We are a part of a country, the United States of America. We're part of a state. We're a part of a community. And as such, we need to understand that God has not called us to withdraw from this world. Many of the places that you will find that have been given over, and it seems like Satan now has control over them, is because of what I call Christian flight. They simply pulled out and left. We can never forget that we are members in this world. I looked up the definition of citizenship. It is the quality of an individual's response to membership in a community. Citizenship is the quality of an individual's response to being a member of a community. The kingdom of this world is a temporary institution at best, and its goals are to simply maintain outward order in the public arena by means of power, natural law, and human reason. The kingdom of God, however, is an eternal kingdom, and its goal is to call individual souls into the kingdom of God through faith, through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, do I... I was thinking about this. I don't have to... 
stand here and tell you just how far this world has fallen, do I? Does anyone need an example of the fall of the world? Okay, I didn't think so. This week, though, <laughs> I ran across an example that moves this whole country from the ridiculous to the sublime. I really now really get a handle on how people think and how they come to conclusions. And I'm going to do this by introducing to you my new friend, Neutro. There's Neutro. Neutro is a Mayak monkey from Indonesia. In 2011, a photographer was in Indonesia taking pictures. Neutro stole his camera and run off into the jungle. And he began to take selfies. See? Isn't he pretty? The photographer chased him down, found the pictures, and printed them. And they became a viral sensation. I mean, pictures of Neutro wound up everywhere. The pictures taken by a monkey. In 2014, there was a suit appeared in a San Francisco court. And Neutro was suing the photographer to return the wealth that he had made from pictures that Neutro made and not the photographer. It went from a regular court right up the ladder until last week in the Ninth Circuit of Appeals in California, one of the highest and most liberal appeals court in the nation, finally heard this case that had gone all the way up the ladder. And they came up with this ruling, that Neutro did not have standing in the court. Now, that's a legal term that means you don't have a right to bring any kind of a case against someone. And they said that because Neutro was not a human, he was a monkey. That's pretty good. But you see, Neutro did not bring this case, okay? PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, not saying anything about them. But they decided they would sue to help Neutro get his money. Now, I've not figured out what Neutro would need that money for. I mean, if you were to ask him, he would probably tell you he's got everything, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The futility that I saw in this is this. Not that this district court finally used some judgment and said, hey guys, this is a monkey. He doesn't have standing in the court. The amazement to me is that there is a group of people who would think the monkey does have standing, and there are about five courts down the line that would hear a civil suit against a monkey. That tells me why people can come up with the dumb stuff that they come up with. This is what they're thinking. This is this kingdom. This is this place that we live in. But understand something. When I share with you that the body of Christ, the church, is most effective not in this building or any other building, but in the world where you live. That means your neighborhood, your job, the guys down there that play horseshoes. No matter where you go in life, God created the church to be there. He didn't create the church to back out of there. Let me say this very quickly. In over 40 years of ministry, I have watched us pervert biblical evangelism. 
You say, how did they do that, preacher? Very simply, we said evangelism could only be done on Monday night at 7 o'clock after you had a fellowship meal at church. Then you would take names of people, unsuspecting people, who came to your church. You would knock on their door at 8 o'clock and be surprised when they would pretend they're not home. That's what we called evangelism for years. And when everybody found out the Baptists would be out Monday night, the Baptists were smarter. We started going Tuesday night. Isn't that great? We have forgotten why God created the church. But I want to warn you, in this world, people are not going to listen to you. They're, they're really not. You know, I have people all the time say, I tried to witness my neighbor. He wouldn't listen to me. And I said, are you surprised? And it seems like it will take us by surprise. Don't forget the thinking of this world and the morality of this world. Well, I run across a video that I liked. <laughs> you see, the subject is, it's about the nail. It's about the nail. Watch this and you'll get what I'm talking about. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me. And I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head. And it's relentless. And I don't know if it's going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever going to stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there... Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing... You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just... Sometimes it's like there's this achy... I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Yeah, I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on. Ow. If you would just don't try to see things my way. Never hurts to have a little humor to point out the obvious. That's the thinking. Your neighbors, your friends, and family, no matter how much, how many problems they may have, no matter how desperate their situation may be, they don't want you to talk about the fix. They, they don't want to, for you to talk about the reasons behind it. The, the obvious way that God created human beings to live. And that is in relationship with Him. So this morning, I wanted to let you know, I understand. You're going to run across people with nails in their head, and all they want you to do is listen to them. But I want to warn you too, that if you withdraw from this world, if you withdraw from your community, and you know, you can live in the midst of a lot of people and be withdrawn. Several years ago in a church that I attended, came up with what was called block parties. And I simply asked people in our church to commit on a Saturday, several friends get together and barbecue in their front driveway and invite all their neighbors around to come and eat hamburgers, hot dogs, or whatever they cooked, and spend several hours. We had about 15 locations. We probably had about 400 people attend. But here was the number one thing that came back to me. And it was a very honest evaluation. Pastor, I met people that I've lived next door or two doors down that my only communication with them was waving when I either left home or came back home. 
I learned people's names in my neighborhood, and I've lived there for 15 years. You see, the society today is a withdrawn society. They are not open, not only to the gospel, they're not open to most anything simply because they do not trust, they don't know what the truth is, and they have become suspicious of everything. And yet, God has called the church not to retreat and not to bang on doors of people who you don't know, who don't want to see you when they're sitting down to dinner or it's late at night. Our call has always been from the very beginning to live in the world in which we have been placed, not only live in this world, not only live in our state, in our community, in our country, but we are to blossom there in order that in our blossoming under the blessing of Christ, it will invoke suspicion, it will invoke awe. People are going to want to know what hope a person has that will allow them to face the same life they face every day, yet with a hope, with a smile, and always moving forward. God's plan of evangelism has always been in the streets, in the homes, in the communities, in the countries where we have been placed. Martin Luther said, a Christian man is the most free Lord of all and subject to none. And then he said this, a Christian man is the most dutiful servant of all and subject to everyone. Therein, I believe, lies the reason of our retreat. We are an American. And if you want to know a, a worldview of Americans, top on the list is our arrogance we feel like that we are probably two or three degrees higher than any other person in any other place. I, I don't know that we try to observe this, but I think this country is so bountiful, it is so blessed, that we take for granted and we walk in a state that this is what is owed us. But as Christians... When we look at the example that our Maker, our Master, our Savior, the head of the body of Christ, His example was this. When people talk about His ministry for three and a half years, they talk about raising the dead, seeing the blind uh, receive sight, the deaf begin to hear, all of the miracles, but the one thing that stands out just like a nail in your head is that our Savior spent three and a half years serving mankind. He served those who followed Him. He served those who did not follow Him. He served those who loved Him, and He served those that did not love Him. In all things, Jesus said, He came to serve and not to be served. And somehow, that gets a little bit under our skin that we would humble ourselves to the point of helping someone that we don't know or helping someone that uh, doesn't look like us or helping someone that may live in another section of town or another country, we get messed up with that. This morning, my text really comes from Jeremiah 29. It's a verse most everybody knows. For I know the plans I have for you. Plans for welfare, not for calamity. A future and a hope. We use the, that verse all the time. Now, uh, again, as I, I, I teach on Wednesday nights a lot, I say to people, remember that the Bible was not written to us in every circumstance, but it was always written for us. In other words, what was true for Israel, which that verse was given to, that promise is true for us today. 
But the context of that promise is in a little different circumstance. You see, when God created a people in Egypt, a, a people who went over 80 people in, 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 at the beginning and came out millions, His people, His chosen people, a priesthood, and His calling to Israel in taking them into a, prom, a foreign land, this land that people already lived in, a heathen land where idolatry was around every tree, every corner. The reason that he took these people into this world was that Israel would be a light to the nations which would draw all people to the one true and living God. Israel was to live amongst the heathen, amongst idolaters, against those of different nationalities, against, uh, amongst those that hated them for this reason. They were to be a living example of the power of God to create something out of nothing, the power of God to empower a feeble group of people to become not only a mighty nation, but mighty warriors. And that was God's plan of evangelism. Israel was to be a light. You know, we hear salt and light so much that when we hear that, we just go into neutral and we think of messages we have heard on that. But there's truth in this. We, this world we live in is dark, evil, sinful. It's there. It will get you if, you if you're not careful. It's darkness. And the only way for people to know what real darkness is is to understand what pure light is. Because without light as an example, they don't know what darkness is. Without salt being the preservatives, this world will continue in its rotting stage. But God said, my people will be a light to the nations. They will not only be a preservative, they will be a spice, they will be a medicine. My people are going to be what this world in sin needs. That has never changed. But Israel didn't listen to the voice of God. They moved in, and instead of being light, they began to take on these other idols, these other gods that these countries around them worship. And they rebelled against the commandments of God. They began to practice even child sacrifice, some of the greatest abominations against God. And so God sent a man named Nebuchadnezzar. And he overthrew this once proud city of Jerusalem, literally leveled it, carried away all of the articles from the temple and placed them where he has always placed them. And he sent Israel into captivity. Then along comes Jeremiah. Jeremiah sends him, to a, sends him a letter. Jeremiah 29, beginning with verse 1. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests and the prophets and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah and the queen mother and the eunuchs and the officials and the of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen, the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. This letter was sent by the hand of Elash, the son of Shapan, son of Jeremiah, son of Hilkah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent into Babylon. It said, this is the letter. Thus said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all exiles whom I have sent into exile, from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and your daughters in marriage. 
that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there. And he says, do not decrease. Then it says, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on behalf, on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. There's many ways to leave life without actually traveling. And I'm afraid today we are the church that clusters together and makes few ripples where we live. I'm not talking about demonstrations. I'm not talking about uh, boycotting Disney or boycotting some other... I'm, I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about taking the admonition of God, which if you follow that into the New Testament, when Christ sent His church into the world, and you follow the growth of the early church, it was by people who lived next door to people who shared the gospel, who shared the hope for, that was within them. That's how the church spread. It was spread by men that God had ordained and sent out, but always it was the house to house and door to door. God was saying to these exiles, I believe, you refused to be a light in freedom. Now I'm commanding you to be a light in darkness. You say, how can a, a, a group of captives change a circumstance or situation? Let me remind you that one of the exiles was about a 13-year-old boy named Daniel. And if you read the story of Daniel, he refused to defile his body. And he didn't do it through protest of what he was going to eat. He very humbly said to the guy that was over him, Look, man, I don't eat that stuff. But my God is able to bless me and I'll be just as strong just as bright following the commandments of my God as your people will be following that dietary. That's Cliff's commentary on what it said. And sure enough, of all of the scholars, he and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood above the rest because in the darkness of their place, in the push of a king saying, eat this, they sought God's protection and in the name of the Lord, they refused to go along. We read that in the latter years of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar made one of the most beautiful pronouncements of who the God of heaven was because a 13-year-old boy stood his ground in darkness. These people were told, don't go there and gripe and grumble. They said, build houses. In other words, build houses, live a life, plant gardens, and eat the produce. The letter said, guys, when you get there, live life just like everybody else. Other people have gardens, you make gardens. You build houses, get married. Give your sons and daughters in marriage. I want you to become infused in this culture. Today, I believe that we are losing in this world because the church remains in, behind closed doors and not infusing themselves into the world. Now, before somebody says, you mean you want us to go out and do what the world does? Not at all. Not at all. Listen. A Christian is not a Christian because they are, there's something spiritual going on inside of them. And then going out and acting the same way as everyone else. A child of God 
has that difference in them, and that difference will be in the way that they handle life, the way that they look at themselves, the way that they trust God, not in special arenas, but just every day life. Do you know that Bible reading and prayer is not illegal in the schools? Any kid that wants to whip a Bible out in their free time and read that Bible and pray, they're not going to be stopped. You know, I've had people tell me, my boss man stopped me from witnessing. I said, when did you... When, when did, were you witnessing? Well, we were out on the production field, and I just took the time to begin to tell somebody something. Listen, God does not want you to take time away from your job. God doesn't want you to waste somebody's time. God doesn't want you to be a worker that is ashamed. God wants you to be a productive worker, not only a productive worker, but the very best worker that you can be, realizing that God will open doors you can't imagine. We have forgotten that it is God who opens every door of communication. And we've forgotten that because I think we live for the most part not looking for these opportunities because we're afraid we may have to witness. And we're not prepared. Because for so long they said, you've got to come to a 16-week course. And we will teach you what to say and how to present the gospel to someone. Now I've always... It's okay to learn shortcuts and learn Scripture. But I've always believed this. I know exactly how I got saved. <laughs> it's clear as a bell to me. Every step along the way. How God spoke to me. How He convicted me of my sins. How I just simply got on my knees to confess my sins and said, God, I am a sinner and I need you. That is is the way to Christ. There is no other way. You have a life before Christ, and you have a life after Christ. And I have found that when we are open to the leadership of God, He will open similar doors in someone else's life. Many of you know that the day after I preached my first message, our little boy, Third son, Marcus Jeremy, was born, lived 20 minutes, and died. That was one of the darkest days of my life. And it was darkest because I had only become a Christian for about three or four months. And, and here we lose our baby. God brought me through that without bitterness or questioning. Over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, because I was in that valley, God has given me the opportunity to share hope beyond the loss. And every person who is a child of God has stories of hope beyond lostness. And when you look in our cities and our communities and the people who make them up, there is lostness lostness and defeat and despair and nothing to hope in. Oh, we say the stock market is higher than it's ever been. Don't forget that a couple of months ago it dropped 570 points. There is nothing in this world that was created that will last but the soul of man and the Word of God. Everything else will fail. And God has called His church the same that He called Israel in their captivity. Build houses. Plant gardens. Marry. Increase. Don't decrease. The letter went further. Pray. Pray for the welfare of the city in which you live. Because in its welfare, your welfare. Christians, I want to remind you, we've forgotten that. The most powerful weapon 
in the arsenal that God has given us as a people is prayer. I call it war on the floor. And yet, there is a direct indictment as we gripe about our leaders and their crookedness and their craziness and we gripe about things in our nation and in our state and we gripe and we gripe the call clarion call comes have we prayed for the city that we live in that sometimes is praying for your enemies and jesus himself had something to say about that he said Pray for your enemies. The great tool, the opening, is prayer before God. Listen, there is not a business that anyone in this room has been in or is in currently that can prosper without preparation. Listen, I don't care. When I go to a doctor, I want him to know what he's talking about. I don't even like to go to a practicing attorney. I want somebody who's got the practicing over. You know what I mean? And these doctors that put it up, this doctor has a practice. I don't want to go to him. I want the doctor that says, I'm through practicing. I can get it done. We need to understand preparation in the life of a Christian before you leave your front door is on your face before God. The preparation for reaching your family with the gospel of Jesus Christ is on your face before God, begging God to save them. And if you want a nation to change, if you want godly people to be brave enough to step up and take offices, then you pray that God would empower, God would strengthen, and raise up the people that will be a sensible, godly voice from the grassroots of Benel to the halls of Congress in Washington, D.C. But what we do most often is gripe, grumble, and bellyache, and be against something. God has called us to be productive in this world. God has called us to be the answer, and the only answer that is available for mankind is the gospel of Jesus Christ and its practical applications in the everyday life of every man, woman, boy, and girl. And I'll tell you this. When you live and go out and in and people know that you are real, you just haven't put on your Sunday best. Remember when you used to have Sunday go to meet and close? Remember that? Come on. See, y'all did. Y'all live in the same generation. You had clothes that you didn't touch to Sunday, including socks and shoes. The whole, that was Sunday clothes. Don't wear your Sunday clothes. God has called us to be clothed in righteousness seven days a week. Not our righteousness, but the righteousness He has imputed in us. And he has called us to be the answer to the questions of life. He has called us, I believe, and my heart is going there more and more every day, to a generation of children that we can save. The generation of about 6,000 a day that are boarded, Those children are gone. Did you know that if you study dictators and people who take over countries, you know how they do it? Children. Hitler had his children's corps. All you got to do is go on the internet and you'll see small kids with a rifle twice as big as they are in these Middle East countries. And ISIS and those groups are using them to wage war. We take away hope from children. We take away 
any belief that life can ever be better. And we teach them the ways of ungodliness. We teach them the ways of immorality. We teach them the ways of getting by. And we stand by and we forget that God's greatest call to us is to reach out to widows and orphans. And I'll tell you this, an orphan doesn't have to be a child that doesn't have living parents. An orphan is a child whose parents don't care for that child. You say, well, so we're just going to go after children, not adults. No. No, not at all. But I'm telling you this. By the same way those despots took over countries through children, you can change countries and the life of people through reaching children with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why we spend the money here that we do for children. Because the hope is that in reaching that child at a tender age and giving them a hope that they will not find at school, sometimes at home, or anywhere else, that hope they can hold to, that hope that cannot be taken away, that child light will begin to shine in that family, and mothers and fathers will come to Christ because of a godly child. It's the same thing as living in the community. Listen, we're, spending, we're, we're, we're sending spies into families. June 11th through the 13th, we're going to the park to make more spies. We had about 300 kids last year. I hope we have 600 kids. I want them to hear that Jesus Christ died for them. I want them to hear that what they see is not all there is. And I want them to hear that in Christ all things are possible. And then I want them to show their parents who don't deserve to be loved and respected love and respect. I want lights to shine. Benel, Palm Coast, Flagler Beach. I want them to shine from children that come to Christ. I want it to shine from our church who is in everyday life, not just with a verbal witness, but a real lived out faith in God that this ain't all there is. There's hope. Pray. Pray for where you're going. Every person here lives in a mission field. You realize that? Every person here. We're going to be taking a, a, jar, a, a larger step internationally very soon. Why? Because Jesus commanded go into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, in the uttermost parts of the earth. And Christians cannot be obedient to God without going into their Jerusalem, their Judea, their Samaria, and into the uttermost parts of the earth. It's not either or. It's all of it together. And God has said He will supply our needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus our Lord. I saw <clears throat> a little thing from Clergy Network. <clears throat> Excuse me, my allergies are getting me. It showed a picture of a city, several streets, and it said, Here's a Christian. Here's a Christian. Here's a Christian. All over the life of that church, that city. I want to challenge you, church, Community Baptist Church. You're living in a mission field. 
Everywhere you go is a mission field. Everywhere you go can be a divine appointment orchestrated by God. There's not a lady here that is living with a husband who does not know Christ, that, it will, that that husband cannot come to Christ through the saving power of God through prayer intervening on his behalf. There's not <clears throat> a husband who has a wife that does not have this relationship with Christ, that cannot say, I have no hope. Because through prayer and living out that life, both all of the gospel you believe, through the power of God, that wife coming to Christ. That's what this church exists for, guys. It's not come here and eat chicken together on Sunday. That's going to be fun. I'm going to eat my share. But I hope it'll load you up and give you energy for tomorrow morning. There are people not going to eat today. In this neighborhood, in this, these communities, there's people who have no hope about anything. I want our church to live scattered. We're exiles. Let's make the most out of this world. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 13 says, The day, the night is far spent. The day is here. What he's talking about is that night before Christ, that time period when the Messiah was expected, that day has come. That night is gone. The day is here. This is all we have. If God grants Monday morning, we have Monday. Let us live with the urgency that our Savior had when he came to earth, spread out his arms, and died for you. This morning, if you sit here and you've never really experienced the saving grace and power of God, you, you may no doubt realize there's a need in your life for a Savior. But for some reason, you, you continually put it off. I pray this morning God has shaken you. Because you see, you don't have a story to tell other than defeat. You don't have a hope to look forward to. Because your Father is not in heaven. And he is here saying, I died for you. Come to me. To our my church, those visiting, those looking for a church, it's who Community Baptist Church is. We live, dwell, and thrive in the streets of our community. And by the help and grace of God, there's not going to be a place that's not going to hear the voice or the witness of Christ through the people of this church. If you're looking for that type of church, you, you come join us. For the rest of us, I just want to say to you this morning, our praise team is going to come and they're going to sing a song called, I Surrender All. That's a tough song. Easy to sing until you listen to the words. You know, God is not expecting any more out of anybody then we're able to give in the power of God. That's what he expects. I would just ask you this morning, church, are you ready to lay it all on the altar? Are you ready to commit your all to see God move and work in our part of the world that he's planted us? Pray for our cities, for in their welfare, is our welfare. Our fathers, we come to you this morning. I pray that your spirit, God, is moving. I pray that your spirit is calling. I pray, O oh Lord, that you would show yourself strong even today in the life of this church. 
God, thank you for everyone that's here today. I love Sundays, Lord. God, I love to see these people get to walk around and talk with people that I know better every day and love better. But, oh, God, how I want to see us scatter. How I want us to realize the mission field that you have blessed us with. Every tribe and nation here, within driving distance, sometimes walking distance. Lord, may we surrender. May we live open-handedly. May we say that there's not any part of our life or those things that we have that we hold close to the vest, but all to you we give. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.